Taking the Veil by Catherine Mansfield Read by The Story Girl It seemed impossible that anyone should be unhappy on such a beautiful morning. Nobody was, decided Edna, except herself. The windows were flung wide in the houses. From within there came the sound of pianos. Little hands chased after each other and ran away from each other, practicing scales. The trees fluttered in the sunny gardens, all bright with spring flowers. Street boys whistled. A little dog barked. People passed by, walking so lightly, so swiftly. They looked as though they wanted to break into a run. Now she actually saw in the distance a parasol, peach-colored, the first parasol of the year. Perhaps even Edna did not look quite as unhappy as she felt, it was not easy to look tragic at eighteen, when you are extremely pretty, with the cheeks and lips and shining eyes of perfect health. Above all, when you are wearing a French blue frock and your new spring hat trimmed with cornflowers. True, she carried under her arm a book bound in horrid black leather. Perhaps the book provided a gloomy note, but only by accident. It was the ordinary library binding. For Edna had made going to the library an excuse for getting out of the house to think, to realize what had happened, to decide somehow what was to be done now. An awful thing had happened. Quite suddenly, at the theater last night, when she and Jimmy were seated side by side in the dress circle, Without a moment's warning, in fact, she had just finished a chocolate almond and passed the box to him again, she had fallen in love with an actor. But fallen in love. The feeling was unlike anything she had ever imagined before. It wasn't in the least pleasant. It was hardly thrilling unless you can call the most dreadful sensation of hopeless misery, despair, agony, and wretchedness, thrilling, combined with the certainty that if that actor met her on the pavement after, while Jimmy was fetching their cab, she would follow him to the ends of the earth, at a nod, at a sign, without giving another thought to Jimmy or her father and mother or her happy home and countless friends again. The play had begun fairly cheerfully. That was at the chocolate almond stage. Then the hero had gone blind. Terrible moment. Edna had cried so much she had to borrow Jimmy's folded, smooth-feeling handkerchief as well. Not that crying mattered. Whole rows were in tears. Even the men blew their noses with a loud trumpeting noise and tried to peer at the program instead of looking at the stage. Jimmy, most mercifully dry-eyed, for what would she have done without his handkerchief, squeezed her free hand and whispered, "'Cheer up, darling girl.' And it was then she had taken a last chocolate almond to please him and passed the box again. Then... There had been that ghastly scene with the hero alone on the stage in a deserted room at twilight, with a band playing outside and the sound of cheering coming from the street. He had tried. Oh, how painfully, how pitifully, to grope his way to the window. He had succeeded at last. There he stood, 
holding the curtain, while one beam of light, just one beam, shone full on his raised, sightless face, and the band faded away into the distance. It was... Really, it was absolutely... Oh, the most... It was simply... In fact, from that moment, Edna knew that life could never be the same. She drew her hand away from Jimmy's, leaned back, and shut the chocolate box forever. This, at last, was love. Edna and Jimmy were engaged. She had had her hair up for a year and a half. They had been publicly engaged for a year. But they had known they were going to marry each other ever since they walked in the botanical gardens with their nurses and sat on the grass with a wine biscuit and a piece of barley sugar each for their tea. It was so much an accepted thing that Edna had worn a wonderfully good imitation of an engagement ring out of a cracker all the time she was at school. And up till now they had been devoted to each other. But now it was over. It was so completely over that Edna found it difficult to believe that Jimmy did not realize it too. She smiled wisely, sadly, as she turned into the gardens of the convent of the Sacred Heart and mounted the path that led through them to Hill Street. How much better to know it now than to wait until after they were married? Now, it was possible that Jimmy would get over it. No. It was no use deceiving herself. He would never get over it. His life was wrecked, was ruined. That was inevitable. But he was young. Time, people said, time might make a little, just a little difference. In forty years, when he was an old man, he might be able to think of her calmly. Perhaps. But she... What did the future hold for her? Edna had reached the top of the path. There, under a new-leafed tree, hung with little bunches of white flowers, she sat down on a green bench and looked over the convent flower beds. In the one nearest to her, there grew tender stalks, with a border of blue shell-like pansies, with at one corner a clump of creamy freesias, their light spears of green crisscrossed over the flowers. The convent pigeons were tumbling high in the air, and she could hear the voice of Sister Agnes, who was giving a singing lesson. Amen, sounded the deep tones of the nun, and Amen, they were echoed. If she did not marry Jimmy, of course she would marry nobody. The man she was in love with, the famous actor, Edna had far too much common sense not to realize that would never be. It was very odd. She didn't even want it to be. Her love was too intense for that. It had to be endured, silently. It had to torment her. It was, she supposed, simply that kind of love. But Edna, cried Jimmy, can you never change? Can I never hope again? Oh, what sorrow to have to say it, but it must be said. No, Jimmy, I will never change. Edna bowed her head, and a little flower fell on her lap, and the voice of Sister Agnes cried suddenly, Oh, no. And the echo came. Oh, no. At that moment, the future was revealed. 
Edna saw it all. She was astonished. It took her breath away at first. But after all, what could be more natural? She would go into a convent. Her father and mother do everything to dissuade her, in vain. As for Jimmy, his state of mind hardly bears thinking about. Why can't they understand? How can they add to her suffering like this? The world is cruel, terribly cruel. After a last scene when she gives away her jewelry and so on to her best friends, she so calm, they so broken-hearted, into a convent she goes. No, one moment. The very evening of her going is the actor's last evening at Port Willen. He receives by a strange messenger a box. It is full of white flowers. But there is no name, no card. Nothing? Yes, under the roses, wrapped in a white handkerchief, Edna's last photograph with, written underneath, the world forgetting by the world forgot. Edna sat very still under the trees. She clasped the black book in her fingers as though it were her missile. She takes the name of Sister Angela. Snip, snip. All her lovely hair is cut off. Will she be allowed to send one curl to Jimmy? It is contrived somehow. And in a blue gown with a white headband, Sister Angela goes from the convent to the chapel, from the chapel to the convent with something unearthly in her look, in her sorrowful eyes, and in the gentle smile with which they greet the little children who run to her. A saint! She hears it whispered as she paces the chill, wax-smelling corridors. A saint! And visitors to the chapel are told of the nun, whose voice is heard above the other voices, of her youth, her beauty, of her tragic, tragic love. There is a man in this town whose life is ruined. A big bee, a golden furry fellow, crept into a freesia, and the delicate flower leaned over, swung, shook. And when the bee flew away, it fluttered still as though it were laughing. Happy, careless flower. Sister Angela looked at it and said, now it is winter. One night, lying in her icy cell, she hears a cry. Some stray animal is out there in the garden, a kitten or a lamb or, well, whatever little animal might be there. Up rises the sleepless nun, all in white, shivering but fearless. She goes and brings it in, but the next morning, when the bell rings for matins, she is found tossing in high fever, in delirium, and she never recovers. In three days all is over. The service has been said in the chapel, and she is buried in the corner of the cemetery reserved for the nuns, where there are plain little crosses of wood. Rest in peace, Sister Angela. Now it is evening. Two old people, leaning on each other, come slowly to the grave and kneel down, sobbing. Our daughter. Our only daughter. Now there comes another. He is all in black. He comes slowly. But when he is there and lifts his black hat, Edna sees to her horror his hair is snow white. Jimmy! 
Too late. Too late. The tears are running down his face. He is crying now. Too late. Too late. The wind shakes the leafless trees in the churchyard. He gives one awful, bitter cry. Edna's black book fell with a thud to the garden path. She jumped up, her heart beating. My darling! No, it's not too late. It's all been a mistake, a terrible dream. Oh, that white hair! How could she have done it? She has not done it. Oh, heavens! Oh, what happiness! She is free, young, and nobody knows her secret. Everything is still possible for her and Jimmy. The house they have planned may still be built. The little solemn boy with his hands behind his back, watching them plant the standard roses, may still be born. His baby sister... But when Edna got as far as his baby sister, she stretched out her arms as though the little love came flying through the air to her, and gazing at the garden, at the white sprays on the tree, at those darling pigeons blue against the blue, and the convent with its narrow windows. She realized that now, at last, for the first time in her life, she had never imagined any feeling like it before. She knew what it was to be in love. But in love.